Dr. Marsha Tate Arunga, thank you so much for joining me for Like Fine Wine, Black Joy Over Time. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a project of joyful practices, joy actualization coaching. And I'm so excited that you're here today. Um, thank you. You're I'm so excited welcome. too. So Dr. Marsha Tate Arunga, you are a cultural historian. You are a mother a grandmother, a cultural custodian, yes, and an educator. Um, I just want to thank you for all the ways that you have contributed to my growing into my fullness as a woman, mm. as a black woman, as a part of this community. Um, I told you earlier today that I remember seeing you in community and seeing your family and your kids, you know, mm-hmm. talking about living in, in Kenya and all the things that they were learning, all the things that they would share with the community when they came back. Mm-hmm. And just, and also seeing you at Seattle Central when I was a student and just being like, I know who she is. Does she know who I am? And um, eventually going to Kenya with you in 2009, um, I think the thing that has most stuck with me is your your love of connecting Africans in the African diaspora. The facility with which you bring women together for a myriad of purposes, for um, supporting women in Kenya around clean water, for um, bringing needed resources to Kenya, for supporting the work that's on the ground, and just seeing how you're able to mobilize people and also be in sisterhood with people. Mm-hmm. I have also appreciated the way you've been like, that you've called me in, in ways that are really loving and clear, mm-hmm. and have called me to be bigger and better and more of me by saying, you know, that didn't work. Let's try something else. <laughs> and um, and doing it with love and still being in community with me and, and, just, and just showing up as someone who I can always access for resource and guidance and love. And so I just really appreciate that. And I appreciate seeing all of your greatness. You're also an author. You mm-hmm. also run a school, a, a university. So just seeing you shine has been such an inspiration. I'm so grateful. Wow. Oh, Nicola. You know, thank you. Thank you. And just watching you and, and seeing how you grow, always remembered you. Mm-hmm. I always remembered you. I remembered you when you had short hair. I remembered you when you had long braids. I remembered you in the community. And I think you brought a lot of joy just being Mm. there, uh, being present, watching people, watching me Mm -hmm. um, brings joy. You know, if you're out there and nobody's coming through, you are really kind of lonely. So I have had a lot of... um, wonderful memories of seeing you in the community too. Thank you. And uh, love the way that you've come up and so honored that you not only went to Kenya with us, but you went with Nia, my daughter, to Jamaica. And you were working on that and I want that to happen. I still want that to happen. So So do I. um, Just thinking about how awesome you have been and your family and those Mm. legacies that you come from uh, really have shaped a lot for for our community. Mm. So I think um, while I'm honored that you are I- interviewing me, I think of all you and the people you represent in different mm. generations who are also, you know, holding it down and bringing joy. Thank you so much. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. Well, with that, can you share... Um, either a story or some of your memories about how you experienced joy as a child? Yes, I think what first comes to mind, I think of family and uh, as a young child, you know, my father's from Louisiana. Okay. And when he came here, um, he would sin for his brother and eventually his, his sister. And it is there that he was an entrepreneur Mm-hmm. And he did a lot of different businesses, and one was a restaurant, so his, his sister was an excellent cook. Mm. So they had, you know, Chinatown today 
in Seattle was actually an African American community. Wow. It was a black uh, black uh, part of the community, and he had a restaurant there. Mm -hmm. And my uncle, who was big and tall, was like the bouncer, and, <laughs> and my aunt was the one cooking. And uh, he was the businessman counting the money. Um, as I got born and raised, he was in real estate at that time, but the family continued to gather. Mm -hmm. And um, I have a wonderful memory. I must have been seven, six or seven, and my grandfather, I'm told, you know, and I knew by the time I would meet with him that I was one of his favored grandchildren. Wow. He just loved me. Uh, the story is, I don't know, I clung to him at, at the playground <laughs> or something and we bonded. And so when he would come, we'd all gather. And I remember they would drink Olympia beer and I'd be under the table and my grandfather, <laughs> I'd say, can I have a sip? And he'd give me, <laughs> he'd slip me a sip under the table. And everyone was just, um, and I still love beer to this day. <laughs> but uh, everyone was just gregarious, loving, happy children mm -hmm. um, of different ages. I was mm -hmm. one of the younger ones. Uh, and I think that being surrounded really gave me a lot of security. Mm. Uh, which I think gave me that joy as well. Okay. So that would be one of my early memories. Maybe I was even younger than six or seven. It's hard to... I must have been actually three or four because I remember being in my uncle's house when that happened and they moved, we all moved to the South End mm -hmm. by the time I was five or six. Mm -hmm. So that happened before then, that memory that I'm sharing with you. Wow. Yeah. So I think what was what, what I remembered really was the security of being in family, of being in a place where I belonged, mm -hmm. um, that people were playing, loving, having music up high, you know, dancing, practicing the dances and, um, you know, us just belonging to each other. Yeah. yeah. That's so awesome. Yeah. I love that. And it also, it shows in how you roll in community. I feel like our families are our first community, like where we learn yes. to be in community. And That's so, so true. So true. Um, yeah. Family is really uh, the central part of all of who we are. Mm -hmm. You know, when my parents died, I realized that how much, how important family was. Mm -hmm. And I began to find the solace in my children and my grandchildren. And I would just look at them and think that, okay, this is okay. This is about continuity. It's about, you know, it's just a, a new, a new iteration of family. Yeah. So I'm so grateful that I've been able to have that and continue that and, you know, have little ones running around. Yeah. 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 So tell me about your 20s and 30s. What did joy look like for you then? 20s and 30s, actually, I, sp I spent in Kenya. Okay. I moved to Kenya when I was 24 um, years old, and that's where I really had my life. Now, before that, I was at, um, I was at the University of Washington. I became a, a counselor for mm -hmm. the minority affairs. So uh, being a counselor was part ad advisor and it was part um, recruitment. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, I was on stage a lot. I was part okay. of the, the Choreo Poets. You didn't know that? So Giovanna Westwood is my cousin. Giovanna? Mm-hmm. Giovanna, who I know now, or Giovanna? No, Westwood. So like... Choreo poet. She was a, a choreo poet back in the awesome. day. Okay, this is after my time. Okay. Because when I was in the choreo poets, it was um, Gilda Shepherd and Mary Stone Hadley. Okay. And then um, they brought me in. Okay. And we performed in the 70s, early 70s. Yeah. So um, then I left and there were more people who okay. came through. So I didn't Got know it. them all. Um, my sister Azani was part of that, the Choreo Poets as okay. well. And um, it just grew uh, after after the time that I was there. But uh, it was me and Mary and, and Gilda. Wow. And what a, what a 
oh my God, that was so, talk about joy. Mm. What happened to me, and my mother was so a cheerleader for this work I was doing. Um, at that time, I was doing children's free breakfast program okay. and going early in the morning to do that. Um, I remember once when I went to uh, Holly Park, because I lived on Beacon Hill, mm. so that's that was my designation. And Elmer Dixon would pick me up, you know, about <laughs> six o'clock in the morning. And one day my mother said, I'm coming to see what you're doing because she didn't, she was like, this beautiful man is picking you up every morning. <laughs> there must be more to this. I think that's what she was doing. So she said, no, I'm going, I'm coming with, you know, I'll be there. And I think people also had told her, you know, oh, you know, this, this is real radical. Mm -hmm. and, um, she came to the children's free breakfast program. This gave me a great deal of joy. It just came to my, my mind. She came and she sat there. She didn't help me cook. <laughs> and she just watched. And as I started preparing the food, the children would come in and, oh, oh, can I do the pancakes? Oh, I want to, you know, I want to set the table. And I was like, okay, you get to set the table. You do the pancakes. I had a whole racket going on. I still love cooking breakfast, you know, and um, they were just full of joy. And they just, they were at home. Yeah. At the Holly Park Community Center, where there was a little rinky dinky uh, kitchen. Wow. And she watched me um, doing that and preparing the food. And she watched that the joy in those children's eyes. And I remember um, my mother sitting there, and eventually she just got up and left and never, ever stopped me from any work I was doing like that again. Wow. She knew that it was what I was meant to do. Wow. So, and that gave me a lot of joy and assurance that I was doing good work. Yeah. Um, and then uh, the, the being on stage always gave me a lot of joy, too, mm -hmm. at that time. And it's so funny because I sang and I danced and I acted and we did a lot of poetry. We invoked a lot of our ancestral... Um, uh, prose and poetry, uh, lots of Langston Hughes, lots of, I think even Maya Angelou, uh, lots of, lots of different artists, um, Claude McKay and so forth. And we would make these into, um, performances. So that gave me a lot of joy because what I saw and what I believed was that we were igniting into people who did not know their culture, their history. Mm -hmm. We were bringing that to them on stage. Yeah. Um, and just before I left for Kenya, Dr. Hardiman, Joy, who I, yeah. I knew, that at that time I had just met Joy, about 1978, 79. Wow. And we, I found her on the campus of the University of Washington. Now, I was, a, I was in acting, mm -hmm. but, and I was in the Black Theater Project at the university with Steve Sneed. Whoa! And just some awesome, <laughs> awesome people, you know. Um, he got to do a, a Channel 9, a KCTS film during that time. Wow. And we were, you know, we were the, we were the kind of the ones to know. So one day in the spring, um, and I had my, my husband at that time was mm -hmm. the student body president. Okay. So we were running the school. Wow. You know, we were literally in charge of the University of Washington. We didn't even know there were white people there. We just had it going on. That is funny. So um, <laughs> here I was on the campus, and I see these white students. Now, I won't say they were actors, and they literally had white paint on their face. Oh, wow. And um, there's this black woman behind them. You know, she had this awesome haircut. It was real asymmetrical. And she was saying, get in line. No, be quiet. Don't talk. Um, you know, give me more face. Give me more smile. And I said, who is that woman? <laughs> it was Joy Hardiman. And I said, I want to know you. And then, you know, months passed, and um, I was in a play that, uh, In Me Are Many People, that was the name of the play. Mm. Denise Service and Teresa Stone uh, Stovall wrote the play. 
and I was in it, and Dr. Hardiman was in the audience. And she she said that at the end of the play, she said, I just have to know her. Aww. So we began to, you know, just be friends, and she just um, began to flourish as an artist, and I got to be in her play called Good Black Music. It was written by her, uh, Teresa Stovall, and Umeme. Upesi. Oh, yeah. And um, yeah. it was a beautiful, beautiful play. Jerome Jackson, rest in peace, was um, the the music director. Okay. And he was truly a genius. And I enjoyed the play. It was so beautiful. At Langston Hughes, it was one of those plays you do in the summer and the mm -hmm. kids come in. And Felicia Loud was one of the kids. She was about oh, 13 wow. or 14, maybe younger. Um wow. And uh, Kibibi Monet's daughters were in the play. Okay. Just some people who grew, Sam Smith, who became a, a singer um, professional, they were all in this play. And later, uh, before I moved to Kenya, in fact, the play was being performed after I had moved okay. um, to Kenya, and I directed that play. I turned around about two or three years later and um, directed Good Black Music at Langston wow. Hughes like two or three years later. It was, it gave me a lot of joy. Gave me, I had morning sickness. I was on my way to Kenya. I had just been married to my husband and um, I was, you know, really sick and just, wow. but it, it, it was like giving birth to this play. And my <laughs> role as a director, yeah. um, when I went to Kenya, I continued. I started something called the, Kisumu Drama Conservatory. So wow. everything I had learned, I began to teach. And so I would just go around the neighborhood collecting children. I know that's right. And we wow. um, we had this con uh, conservatory at, um, at the, um, it was a place that was not far from my, my home. So, you know, I would walk over there and, and teach, you know, acting classes, stretching, body movement, um, music, choreography, all of that we would, uh, I would teach and then we would perform for their parents. We eventually, we would go to schools and perform. Michael Jackson was one of my favorite, no, the song. Okay. The songs that he had, uh, Billie Jean uh -huh. and those, that era um, were songs I was choreographing to. Wow. And so... Um, it was really an introduction to what I thought was culture in uh, my culture, sharing with uh, Kenya yeah. and with Kisumu. And uh, in 19, maybe 84, I think it was, I uh, living in Kenya now since 1982. So in 84, I uh, was invited by the, um, uh, it was the American embassy, but they had a, uh, kind of a cultural component mm -hmm. with a beautiful um, stage there. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to come and perform for Black History Month. Oh, wow. And so I came and did my one-woman show and the same poetry that I had learned in college and was doing with the choreo poets, I now was doing on stage. Wow. I was, I was six months pregnant with Ebony, so... Um, you know, there she was and I was performing and it was, that gave me so much joy to, yeah. it was, it was the joy of being on stage and of course having an audience, you get a different, a real beautiful, um, sensation from that. But what I really enjoyed was sharing my culture yeah. unapologetically because yeah. they invited me to come one woman show. So there I was Yeah, and I could do it and, and stage it in the way I wanted. I was able to choose my own work and my songs and, um, and really share. And I, I think I was on a mission by that time to mm -hmm. really share, uh, my culture with, with, with people who I came across. And then 1985 was the end of the Women's Decade Conference, the United Nations end okay. of the Women's Decade Conference in, in Nairobi. Mm -hmm. And there I met, um, I was on the, I, I shared a stage with Betty Shabazz, the wife of Malcolm X, the, the widow of Malcolm X, exactly. and Coretta Scott King. Oh. 
And they were there as dignitaries, and I got to meet them and perform in front of them. Oh, how beautiful. Sweet Honey and the Rock was there, mm -hmm. who were like my idol, you know, I idolized them. Uh, Bernice Reagan used to come to Seattle on a regular basis, the Sweet Honey and the Rock, before they got famous. And um, we would practice in Tyree Scott's basement. Um, he had a beautiful home with an wow. open basement, and he and Beverly Sims said, yes, just come and uh, perform at the bottom, you know, all the time. So Bernice trained my voice. She even invited me to be a part of the, the Sweet Honey and the Rock, but I was already headed to Kenya. And here they come <laughs> to Kenya, and they perform, and we were on the same stage performing together, and it was just... Um, a most beautiful, a most beautiful time. Those times gave me a lot of joy. And I, and actually I remember meeting Roz Woodhouse, who was another woman local here. She was from Detroit, but when I turned maybe 16, Roz Woodhouse was the signature on my driver's license. <laughs> wow. She was the state licensor. Okay. And this is a black woman who, I knew her sister. Her mm -hmm. sister was a friend of my sister and um, she had passed away very tragically in a car mm -hmm. accident. And But Roz, I never really got to know until mm -hmm. she came to Kenya for the conference. Right. And we hung out. We had a great time. So um, these were my elders who, uh, who brought me a lot of joy mm -hmm. and were able to share that time with me in Kenya. When I went back to Kisumu, settled my life, you know, with children and uh, doing work, uh, UNICEF came and they asked me, you know, I had been a part of the conference and uh, met lots of dignitaries and members of parliament. Mm. And Grace Ogot was one of them. Grace Ogot was a, um, a writer. She had written many books. I read all of them. They were novels, and um, she also was a cultural custodian mm -hmm. in, in Kenya. The president had appointed her as a member of parliament. Wow. And so I, had, I met her, and then later UNICEF asked me to go work for them, in, not for money. It was, I was on like, a, uh, like an advisory mm -hmm. council. And so we would go on these uh, motorcycles to remote places and talk to women. And find out what they were doing and hear about their lives and um, talk about, you know, they're working on this project. They want to grow, you know, beans, right? Mm -hmm. Literally, you know, and I, I was fascinated, you know, right. not by the idea of growing beans, mind you, but the idea that they had organized themselves, that they were pulling together small amounts of money to do these ama amazing projects, right. these beans were literally put into the marketplace. Um, women who were doing things in a place that was considered, um, uh, you know, food desert, right? Right. But they had the land, and they said, "We're not gonna die. Right. We're going to build, you know, grow this food." And yeah. and they did. They would have projects like chicken uh, making um, uh, chicken coops, where uh -huh. they would have mini chickens and sell the eggs, things like that they would do. Um, a, a woman would say, I, I want to have a school. There's no school in this place. Um, and I'm starting a school tomorrow. You know, I know someone down the street who knows yes. how to talk, uh, write, you know, or read. Yeah. And they would bring them together under a tree. Yeah. And that was a school. Yeah. And I would go out there in that motorcycle. Somebody would take me. I know I didn't drive it myself. <laughs> when I'd get there, I'd see that the tree had had a little structure. Mm -hmm. And there were seven children learning under the tree. And I understood then the power of women. Yeah. You know, and the particularly black women. Yeah. Um, and that might have been the connector for me. Yeah. Because I remember, you know, even then... People would be like, oh, she's just a Musungu, you know. Even my nephew, who you met, he yeah. he grew up thinking I was just a Musungu. Now, what's a Musungu? Is a, um, a white woman, you know. Yeah. And it wasn't necessarily my skin color, though. That didn't yeah. help. Because I knew another woman from Trinidad, um, Violet Odero. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. And Violet was from Trinidad, so mm. she had that accent and maybe a different way of being culturally that people noticed. And they called her a Mazungu. Right. And she was very dark skinned. She to me, she looked like a Luo. Yeah. Who were the people in that area. But they knew that she was not. And so I realized that being a Masungu was, um, you know, somebody who did not live among you, did not really practice your culture. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I kind of, uh, it's funny, one day I was walking down the street from um, theater. I uh -huh. was doing a theater, the, the conservatory. And um, I was walking and these little kids, when they see a Masungu, they go, oh, Masungu, Masungu. Oh, and wow. they laugh, right? So I was walking and they said, oh, Masungu, Masungu. I said, Mimi needs to see Masungu. <laughs> I was so upset that day. I wanted them to know I'm not a Masungu. <laughs> then they keep walking about halfway down the block. They turned around and said, Mwindi. Indian. Uh, that, are you oh, an Indian? Funny. And they meant East Indian. Yeah. Now, I could have answered if I was here. You're yeah. right. I got some Indian blood. You know. <laughs> I said, Hapana. No, I'm not an Indian. And we kept walking. They were like almost, you know, at the end of the block, we're talking a long block. So right. maybe uh, two blocks in, 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 in America. And faintly, they turned around and said, Negro. <laughs> And I said, I had to think for a minute, okay, I'm not going to sit up here and educate these young boys way at the end of the block. I'll take it. I said, yes, I'm a Negro. And they were so satisfied they knew what I was, right? So I, I, I think a lot of my joy came from that moment of connection, you know, when yeah. people understood something about my culture when I could share it with people and they were um, gratified to know, you know, yeah. what my lived experience had been within my culture. And I was so strong then, you know, I was really kind of defiant. I wanted you to know, you know, who my people are. Yeah. I remember once watching the um, Olympics in Kenya. And of course, I'm the only one with the TV. So everybody comes to my oh. house to watch the Olympics. And Florence Joy, um, Joyner Griffith, mm -hmm. is that her name? Florence? Flojo. Yeah. Flo Florence Joyner Griffin was on there, ready mm -hmm. to run. And I said, okay, now everybody stop. This is my <laughs> culture. This is my people right here. <laughs> I had never met Florence Joyner Griffin, but, or whatever her name, Flojo. I had never met her, but I... I wanted them to see, this is my tribe. I told right. them, this is my tribe. And then they go, oh. <laughs> As she won that race in first place. Yeah, you know, got, got and, a little bit more respect there. Yeah, <laughs> they began to understand. And I knew that it had to be a conversation. Mm -hmm. It had to be a, a way of uh, bringing people together and having patience, mm -hmm. you know, because being called a Masungu, if I was called a white person in, in Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. those were fighting words. Right, right. You know, but I learned that, you know, that it required some patience, some education, that even me as an African, mm -hmm. because my blood is just as African as anybody else there. Right. In my view. Mm -hmm. So I felt I had to realize at some point it was about um, shedding light. Yeah. It was about sharing my story of who I am yeah. and, um, you know, just just bringing together what they knew with what I knew so yeah. that, that that could connect the bridge. Right. So that was my 20s was wow. and 30s. I, I moved back here when I was about 34, mm -hmm. 35. I love all of this because this is like the backstory, your your hero, your shiro backstory, mm -hmm. right? It's the things that made you you. So like I'm hearing all kinds of things about like working with dignitaries and and that desire to share your culture and also partake of and share in Kenyan culture. And mm -hmm. those all feel like the roots of cultural reconnection mm -hmm. mission, where which is where you and I really formed a relationship yeah so i i love hearing all of that i also want folks to know that you're multilingual <laughs> yeah well they probably know that by now <laughs> no 
but like I saw you give. I mean, it's, I know a few words in in Delul, a few words in in um, Kiswahili, a few words in Tree, but mm. like. I saw you give a whole entire speech in Duluth when we were there. <laughs> yes. That's a little different. You know what I mean? Thank you. Thank you. You witnessed something that I may not be able to do anymore. Mm. You know, when you when you know a language, you have to practice it. Yeah. And um, so I, in the 11 years, was able to practice. In fact, I had an accent. I still mm. have an accent when I, if somebody comes to me in a different language, you know, I, my accent comes out. I'm like, I didn't mean to, but yeah. it, it just comes out. But um, the language, maybe at one point I was about 75% proficient mm-hmm. in, in the Luo. Mm-hmm. Kiswahili, I actually learned at the University of Washington. Wow. But it wasn't really, um, it was a very uh, academic Kiswahili. Yeah. You know, they, they told me, uh, for example, to invite people to sit down is ka kitako. Mm-hmm. So when I moved to Kenya, I would tell people, oh, karibu, which means welcome, mm-hmm. kakitako. And they would go, and then they'd sit down, you know. And I, it took years for somebody to tell me what I was telling them, oh, it, no. which was sit your butt. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so it was a literal <laughs> translation. And they were really, you know, I mean, that was an insulting thing to say. Well, and also because Kiswahili is a trade language, it yes. shows up as, you know, even if you speak Kiswahili in Kenya, it might be different than the Kiswahili that's spoken in a different area. Yes. You know, yes, so like, true. you know, I just remember trying to get my, so, um, Lesos are like uh, fabric wraps, and they yes. usually have a saying written in Kiswahili at the bottom of it. Yes. And I remember being in different places, even when I was in Tanzania, you know, having asking people to translate the Kiswahili, and they're like, ah, you know, it could mean this, it could mean that, right. you know, and right. that's, you know, based on dialect or group, but, and it because it pulls from different languages because it is a trade language. Absolutely. Right. Well, it is, but it's it's also a stable language now. You know, mm. the United, um, no, the uh, African Union uh, actually adopted Kiswahili as their official okay. language. So okay. um, all the representatives are, and the even the countries where people don't practice Kiswahili are now becoming uh, familiar with it. Okay. So it's a trade language, but it, it was given to the people and it yeah. was meant because, as you say, um, people from different places brought their language and then they, they shared. It was a shared language. That's yeah. what, what it actually achieved. But um, uh, there are times that I had thought that I knew Kiswahili, mm-hmm. but uh, maybe I really was only about 40% proficient in Kiswahili. Um, there were language, the Luo language was all around me. Mm-hmm. And um, there were young people, uh, a teenager who lived with me, Danny. And then there was um, another young uh, nephew um, mm-hmm. who lived, who I, I, I would visit frequently, the Okundis. Uh, oh, so yeah. Barry, yeah. Barry was the one, he must have been seven or eight at the time. Those were my teachers. Yeah. And he would walk around and, and name things like and tell me what that was in Luo. And um, that's how I learned the language. Or if I was walking down the street and I saw security guards at the at the gate and I could talk to them in their language, they would stop and teach me. Now you must learn uh, Luhia, which okay. is a whole nother language right. because they realized I didn't know that one. <laughs> so they taught me all the, you know, all of the greetings yeah. and I would practice them. And it was part of my immersion to know the languages. Yeah. Yeah. But since that time, the more that I uh, am away, mm-hmm. if I don't practice it, when I go back, I realize, oh, I may be able to understand a little bit, but mm-hmm. um, to use the language uh, in the way that I was once fluent has gone away. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And of course, young people, they want to practice their English right. on me. So I'm, I'm a lot, you know, I'm realizing, okay, you know, I can do that. But I worry about that. I worry about how um, language is um, also kind of going away. Mm-hmm. Practices go away. And our, as more television comes to Kenya, what you find is people are being 
um, there's a cultural imperialism happening. Yeah. So yeah. it's more cool to know the dances of the uh, that are on television, the the foods, yeah. the the language, and to master um, English over yeah. Kiswahili or over uh, Kijaluo and the other languages. So um, I, I I I again when I go there want to always encourage the the um, preservation mm -hmm. of culture as people we can remember it. That's wonderful. So what is Joy looking like in your life right now? Well, right now, Joy is, um, I guess it's it's family. It's family, again, you know, just when people are all together, mm -hmm. uh, that brings me a lot of joy. Um, joy right now is um, just thinking back to... Um, you know, last night when I was among um, alumni, it was an alumni event, and they were doing fundraising for uh, for the college, Evergreen State College, Tacoma campus. And um, I think being among and and I the room was maybe ninety percent black, mm -hmm. um, and and we call Evergreen State College Tacoma the only historically uh, <laughs> black college on this side of the Rockies. Dr. Hardiman That's says right. it's historically black community owned, mm. HBCO. Mm. Um, and so we, we, we are really proud of that. And just to be among people, you know, I was at a conference that Orisha Day yeah. um, put on at Langston Hughes about two or three years ago. She always asks me to be the, mistress of ceremony for that conference and puts me to work right away which is fine because mm -hmm. you know i want to i want to be there but you know um i remember once being at the conference and i introduced um i think it was wade nobles and i i know i wanted okay. to be in the audience and listen and write notes i sat in the middle of the audience where there was a chair and after he got maybe 10, 15 minutes into the speech, I just began to look around the room mm -hmm. and around the people who were next to me. And I felt the most amo amazing sense of security. Mm. You know, it was like maybe what I described when I was a child. Yeah. But just being in that space where you so belong, mm -hmm. where everyone is almost breathing the same breath. You know, and, and having the same hopes for the future mm -hmm. and, you know, believing that in this idea of full liberation, even if it's only for that moment, mm. we were just bonded. And I, I felt so um, secure in the middle of that audience yeah. because when you're an MC. You know, you're you're up there in the front of the stage. You don't get to feel that energy. And right. so when I was in the middle feeling that energy, it it so filled me with great joy. Um, I think that that might be one of the most memorable moments when I, I just looked around and said, look at my people. You know, we're all so intent listening you know, people are, are whispering, you know, um, what did he say? Oh, he said this. You know, <laughs> and we're just there, you know, having all engaged together. Do you remember what that felt in, like in your body? Yeah, I think it really, when I think about it, 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 it gave me a sense of relaxation. So mm -hmm. the body went, was just um, floating maybe. Mm -hmm. And... Um, when I looked at people, you know, around my left and my right, I could have been out of body, mm. literally out of body, just noticing for that moment where we were yeah. and what we were learning together. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and whenever I go to gatherings like that, like, like last night and um, just places where I see, um, you know, dancing is always fun too. Yeah. But you don't get that that energy was it was not an intellectual energy, though everyone there were intellectuals. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. a um it was a spiritual energy. Yeah. And 
um, we were being literally carried by the ancestors. Yeah. You know, yeah. and and approved of. You know, you know that when you are sitting there and you are learning to the next level about your people, um, we were we were being approved of. You could feel, okay, the ancestors are happy with this. Yeah. Yeah. That's that's yeah. that's what I remember and what I felt and it's a very elevating so floating is the best way I could say it. I won't say I remember this part of you know, I felt it in my head or I felt my knees you know uh we're happy you know no it, it was really just um just generally lifted mm -hmm. yeah oh i love that i love that yeah so what would you give the what advice would you give the community about joy i would say to my young brothers and sisters that life is more simple than we make it Mm -hmm. We have um, become very complex. Uh, I think we are overstimulated right now mm -hmm. with technology mainly, but um, we're also overstimulated with the information that we're getting at such a quick pace. Yeah. And uh, we don't need to know all of that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a whole lot of stuff we don't have to know. Yeah. I would say that, um, you know, have we gone to the lake and just sat there? Mm -hmm. You know, have we have we gone into the mountains and, you know, just breathed the pines and the evergreens and, um, you know, taking time to do things like that that uh, are simple, are really very fulfilling. And yet we, um, I think we've gotten farther and farther away from that because we have to, you know, respond to all of that information that's coming to us. We have to respond to all the phone calls on our on our uh, phone. And I think that's why you find a lot of elders, you know, saying, oh, throw that stuff away. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, it's like the essence of life mm -hmm. doesn't come from those things. Right. And um, I think I think that not to say life is easy, although I had a Nigerian and I still use his phrase. He used to tell me life is still sweet and easy. Yeah. Um, and I, I do use that. And I think it, it reminds me mm -hmm. that actually life is life. You know, life is it's beautiful to sit mm -hmm. and do nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, imagine ourselves just being um, being in joy, um, maybe with people, maybe sometimes if you need to do your, uh, your time alone, allowing yourself to digest what you have experienced and, and just be alone that we can do that without anything. We don't need an aid mm -hmm. to find joy. We don't really need an aid to find, um, uh, the essence of life, you know, it's there, it's been provided for us. And we are living in a time where even though we're still in a, um, in a subjugated, uh, colonized mm -hmm. state, we still can find our liberation within it. And I think that's what our ancestors knew. They could never have survived, um, with all the horrific things happening to them, mm -hmm. around them, without taking time to really center in the simple, you know, breathing of air, you know. Yeah. The smelling of a orange or a lemon, you know. Yeah. I mean, those kind of things can bring you joy. Yeah. And we, uh, you know, we feel like we have to order joy, you know, from a catalog. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, th those are the things that yeah. the colonial state have encouraged us to, you know, your joy is, you know, when you spend this money on this thing, yeah. you find joy. And it's so opposite that. Yeah. So I think my advice would be to try to strip ourselves of all of those expectations that we are told and, and then ask 
our inner self what what's happening yeah not where's my joy i know you're in there but <laughs> but being aware through our senses of where where joy is at that moment because it's everywhere at every moment we just have to tap into it that's powerful i feel like if folks just took that away that is that you can access it yeah yeah that's amazing and so what would you tell children like smaller children about joy well i would i would just encourage them to keep playing mm -hmm. you know keep playing and play together mm -hmm. you know and fight and work it out you know um create mm -hmm. create creating is so beautiful when you see a child you know i did see on um on a phone you know my my granddaughter i said call your sister and she calls her on the phone and they, they have face to face there, mm -hmm. right? So I was driving, so she showed her and she, oh, hi, Grandma and all that. And then her um, her little sister was there. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that Grandma? Hi, Grandma. <laughs> and I said, uh, I, and I got to see, she turned the camera around. Mm -hmm. And this little girl who was, who is five, maybe five years old now, was just sitting at the table making art. Mm hmm and, you know, I said, okay, when are you coming to, um, you know, when are you coming to see me? Uh, my birthday's coming. Are you mm -hmm. on your way? No, I'm not coming. And the little five-year-old says, <laughs> I'm coming. I can come. <laughs> I want to come. And she's constantly drawing. Oh. She never stopped what she was doing. She mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, she was engaged in that. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say continue, you know, continue to do that continue to play um it doesn't have to be organized play yeah you know it, it's the playing of discovery you know it's the playing of hide and go seek um and i think that's what we should encourage let children play as long as they can because if they play mm -hmm. um a lot and they really know what play is when they grow up they will uh, understand how to work better together yeah. as adults. They will know what teamwork looks like. Mm -hmm. They will know what, um, you know, what it is to be a part of an ensemble. Mm -hmm. um, these are the things that, as an employer, mm -hmm. we find people don't know anything about that. Mm. You know, it's like, yes, I know how to do this work. I can do that. I can check this off. I know how to do that. But do you know how to work with people and find joy yeah. in working with each other? Yeah. Right? Find what is good in each other. Yeah. And I, I really believe that, that the threads of that come from that early childhood and the creativity and the, uh, the bonding that happens that children learn about. You, you're not necessarily going to be bonded with those same people, but you have taken a lesson Mm -hmm. about bonding you've taken a lesson about um about joy about creating into your adult life mm -hmm. and so um i think that we can tell them all day sit still you know go here time for this lesson time for you to go to this yeah but um what they discover what the creator just has provided around them you know i remember my son when he was coming here to move here, he was born in Kenya. Mm. He moved here at about age nine. And um, when he got to the airport, I sent him to move to live with my, my parents. Oh, wow. He and Ebony flew on a plane at seven and nine. Wow. To uh, Seattle. Wow. And the, um, the lights go off in the airport uh, security with his bag he had. We all said, what does he have in there? <laughs> and they opened the bag and he had all of these um, tin uh, uh, strings, you know, tin pieces. But what they do in Kenya, children sit down and make toys yeah. with them. They'll make um, boats yeah. and put them in the water. They'll make, you know, dolls or cars. And, you know, you'll see them riding, driving the car around that they made with these tin yeah. pieces of tin. And he had stacked up 
these pieces of tin so that when he got to America, he would have toys. That's so awesome. Um, I think that's what I would say. Keep the most basic elements. Mm -hmm. You know, you will find joy in the most basic elements to play with. You know, it doesn't have to be something you get from Hasbro. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or, you know, Mattel or whatever those those companies that produce all these toys that we play with. You know, you know, at Christmas, they play with them for one day and then they're broken or gone. <laughs> and right. um, so there's something to be found. There's joy to be found in the very basic elements that um, you can create. Mm -hmm. And and even today, when I think about my son, who is who is a musician, but yeah. he's an artist, he's a creator. Mm hmm. It comes from those early days of, yeah. you know, playing, t turning rocks into a toy with, you know, with those tins. And yeah. Those are the kind of things that unleashed his imagination. Yeah. Oh, that's so good. Yeah. Dr. Marsha Tayatarunga, thank you so much for joining me today thank and you. for sharing with the community. My pleasure. My honor. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah.